Happy New Year, and welcome back to another episode of The Content Mix. My name is Kyler, and today I'll be hosting our first ever roundtable conversation on the podcast. So after about 230 interviews with inspiring marketing experts in Europe who have all shared their personal insights and stories with us, we've decided to revamp our approach to the show in the new year. So going forward, in every episode, we'll speak with not one, but two experts on a specific industry topic that our listeners listeners can relate to. Think of it as a deep dive into a niche subject with a conversation between two professionals who can give us their best advice and provide real examples from working in the field. And to kick off this new format, I've invited back two recent podcast guests who I interviewed in 2021 to discuss a topic we all have plenty of experience with, implementing a successful global content campaign. So it's an honor to invite back two Lisbon-based guests who I'm sure will be key in today's engaging conversation. So first, I'd like to introduce Alan Formigoni, Content and Marketing um, email marketing manager at We Travel, a payment and booking platform for group and multi day travel companies, and Mario Costa, the marketing and communications director at Mans, Portugal's leading fitness and events company. So, without further ado, I want to thank Alan and Mario for joining me today on our new format of the content mix. So, welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank it's, you, Alan. It's, it's, great to, <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you guys back with us, um, and especially after the new year so did you guys have a good holiday season yeah it was good it was good it was great to also see see that be, be with the family again so it's uh, always a good good time to be around <laughs> yes for yeah, sure. get rest and prepare for the coming year hopefully yeah. it'll be a good one for everybody yeah. yes, yes so. for sure i hope so too i know it didn't start off on the the best note right <laughs> with a lot of things going on with the pandemic and kind of the holidays kind of all coming together um, and a lot of people getting COVID, but I think we're going to be positive and, you know, it's a new year, it's a new beginning, and at least we have this new podcast episode to have something exciting, no, to start the year off for sure. Now I was, I'm sure some people who are listening, have listened to the episodes that you guys were featured on in like the last quarter of last year. Um, however, I kind of wanted to learn a bit more so if you could give some more background information about yourself. So Alan, could you tell us a bit more about who you are um, and your background in marketing? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm Alan, I'm Brazilian. Uh, I'm based in Lisbon right now and working for We Travel, just like you said. And I recently led the launch of the We Travel Academy, which is basically a hub of valuable information with uh, like with courses, articles, webinars, interviews, whatever for industry uh, for travel industry professionals. So this is uh, this has been my my late like challenge in my content professional life. Before we travel, I also led another startup content and SEO efforts. And basically, uh, I was in charge for uh, expanding our brand uh, internationally uh, through organic traffic increase. And uh, we did this uh, working in three different languages, three different languages, so English, Spanish, and Portuguese and all over uh, 10 to 15 countries also. So this is basically my marketing background in a few words. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of international experience as well, because it seems like travel for you is something that's important, no? Yeah, definitely. That's why I'm yeah. here. This <laughs> <now>. <laughs> yeah, you make, cause you've been, how long have you been in Portugal again? Uh, just seven months, I guess now. Yeah, so you're still fresh in Lisbon, just like yeah. myself. So, and yeah. you're enjoying it, I'm sure. No? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. an amazing place. Now, and Mario, you're from Portugal, so you're the only native Portuguese here. Could you tell us a bit more about who you are um, and kind of your experience in marketing and why I guess I invited you on the show today? Absolutely. So, as you said, I'm Portuguese. Um, I work at Etmans. It's a fitness training uh, events, wine. It's a very multi multi topic company. And I work here leading the, the marketing and communications department. And before I was uh, at Metro in Germany. Uh, for three years, I, I was responsible for also for, for the global branding, uh, working for 26 countries. So the, the localization and the content part was, uh, is, was a big part of my, of my role uh, during that, those three years in Germany. Before, I was also working in marketing for seven years in, in the, the, the largest publisher in, um, in, in Portugal, uh, Porto Editora. I also was in macro for two years as a digital and, and branding manager. So yeah, my background is all about communication, marketing, content. So yeah, this, that's the field that I like to, to work. 
Yeah, and you worked in, I think, I remember an editorial company, no? I think in Portugal's number one editorial company. Exactly. So you, language and writing is something that you're interested in as well on for a sure. personal level, for, for sure. sure. Yeah. Now, today's topic on the show, we decided, because before, you know, coming up with a topic, I was very, I was excited to start this new format, um, but I also had feedback from both Alan and Mario about what topic we should do and kind of this idea is about how we can, um, I don't know, kind of have a nice conversation about something that's relevant right now. And, uh, and we decided to talk about implementing successful content campaigns because it's something that they both have experience with. Also, I have experience with um, this before I was um, the sales lead and account manager at Vera Content and now the host of the Content Mix. I also was a project manager. Um, so I was actually working with different clients on different content campaigns as well. So it was kind of something that we all had experience in um, and something that's kind of relevant now. I think, you know, as a sales lead at a content agency myself, I've seen a lot of interest now in the new year. A lot of people are looking to start new campaigns and kind of get things kickstarted for 2022. Um, and I do think there's a lot of hope in this time of like the, the pandemic. People are kind of kind of seeing a light at the end of the tunnel in a way, maybe. But I think a lot of people are much more optimistic starting 2022 instead of uh, in comparison to last year, <laughs> 2021, where I think times were a bit darker. Um, so although it might seem time is it's not the ideal time, right, <laughs> with the pandemic, but still it's much better than what we were doing dealing with last year. So I think a lot of companies now are looking to implement a new content strategy. So we thought it'd be really relevant um, and also interesting to talk about this. So I kind of wanted to start off this conversation to hear more about both of your experiences implementing content campaigns. Um, and also if to learn more about if you've worked on more domestic campaigns or international campaigns. So Mario, could you talk to us a bit more about your experience implementing content campaigns in the past um, and what markets you've worked in and if it's been more of on a domestic scale or an international scale? Yeah. Uh, for, for the companies I worked, I had the two scenarios. So I, I was in the, in the, in the editorial and the publishing, publishing company you mentioned before. We, we've created um, a content, a full content strategy only for the national market, for, for the entire country of Portugal. We, mm -hmm. It was a Portugal-based company, but had a, a national lead. So it was a, a campaign targeting parents and students so it was all based on content and not, not about just product and conversion. So it's about creating a relationship through content, through takeaways, uh, th important notes for, for the parents and also for the students. So it was all about content strategy and it was nation, nationwide but for, for the Portuguese market. It was the first time we've implemented this kind of campaign at the time in the brand. It's still, still, it's still alive. It's still, it's, it was the newsletter based, so it's still alive. It's still working after all these years that we implemented it. So it works yeah, because it's all about relationship, good content, useful content mm -hmm. that can really help parents being parents while the kid or the dog is a student, right? So it was all about that. Bennett Metro. In that case, uh, we had international campaigns, uh, content campaigns across the markets. And there were some challenges, of course, because some markets cannot use that kind of content or it needs to be adapted. But in that case, it was about as a global brand manager to develop a campaign that speaks the values of the brand across all the markets because the brand is the same. So uh, I had both experiences in, uh, in my professional background and about mm. content strategy. Now I'm going to ask a question just out of pure curiosity, but I think a lot of times when I speak to different, you know, marketing managers and people in the industry, when it comes to Portugal as a market, many people kind of just push it together with Spain or I Iberia and they don't really care. <laughs> I don't know. I think Portugal is really forgotten a lot of times because it's such a small country. And in, in your experience working in the market, like what makes the Portuguese market unique and why do you think pe we should focus on just kind of targeting that market rather than just clumping it together with with Spain, for example. And, and, and that, that, that's a very, a very good question, because, of course, from from a scale perspective, uh, it's it makes sense to connect with uh, with Spain language wise. It's somehow that it has the similarities. But from a market perspective, it makes sense to make some kind of combinations. But in reality, Portuguese and Spanish people are very different in a lot of topics. When I was working in the, in the food sector, for example, uh, in, at Metro, uh, we are also specialized in, in providing supplies for, for food restaurants and caterers and, and a horrible business. And uh, when I was in Portugal at Macro, um, we understood that there, in the years before, there was an attempt to, to work together with the Spanish market. And it failed because the reality, for example, of the gastronomy, it's quite different. Just to give an example. So, um, 
And when sometimes you perceive, uh, even if you, especially if you don't know the reality, you, you may think that there are some similarities between Portugal and, and Spain, and they are. But from a, a strategy perspective, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's dangerous if you make a strategy that applies to both countries. It, it's not necessarily true. Of course, it depends on the business and depends on a lot of things. But in, in general, it's not necessarily true because there are some specifications that are quite different culture-wise, tradition-wise, uh, habits-wise. So we need to apply the scenario to both countries differently yeah for sure and after have i lived in spain for eight years and then i also have family from portugal now i'm living in portugal i can i can attest to the fact that they're very different i think a lot of people <laughs> they're similar in many ways and i feel like for example me moving to portugal and living in this new market is it's similar enough i didn't feel like culture shock but at the same time i've noticed so many differences just between like the way the people are and the and just the way of being i think so it's definitely important to highlight that and i think it's so important when you're trying to really connect with an audience you know to speak to them in a language that feels comfortable to them so you can't just it's similar but you can't really compare the two so i agree with that analysis that you just gave us now alan as some i want to talk a bit more about your um, experience implementing successful content campaigns especially as someone coming from from brazil and then moving to europe and working in different markets so i'm just curious to hear more about what um campaigns you've done in the past and kind of what your experience is implementing both domestic and international campaigns so uh, in my previous company, uh, it was called Wordpackers, which uh, was a market marketplace for volunteer opportunities, so for people to connect with different volunteer hosts around the world. And then we were approaching, um, we actually had travelers from, I don't know, more than 100 countries, but of course we were not like reaching out to all of them. Uh, so our main targets were um, Brazil, uh, some countries in Latin America, like Argentina, Chile, Colombia, uh, and Peru. Uh, the US was also a big one. And then we were starting to uh, building some campaigns for Europe, especially uh, Spain and Portugal. But then the pandemic came and then we had to change everything. Uh, but anyway, so we had to produce content in all those three languages. And just uh, like agreeing with Mario, uh, it seems that it's easy because it's uh, it's easy to think that, okay, uh, if I have, let's say, Spanish uh, content, I can just uh, promote that content to all uh, those different markets in Latin America, but it's completely different than that. Uh, and each market will have a different way of doing things. So each, uh, each market will have, like, will behave differently, will have its own buyer journey for exactly the same product. So how they make decisions, uh, what they do, what influenced them, or who influenced them, uh, their price perception. So everything changed from market to market, even though they might be uh, in a like similar content or in the same content, or they have like similar uh, similar background. Um, and then now with uh, we travel, we are like our main customers were based all in the U.S. But then uh, once the company start growing a lot. Uh, we also came after some companies and travel professionals, and travel industry professionals in Latin America and now also in Europe now. So we are right now just planning uh, the content strategy that we will do for uh, all those different markets. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's exciting to see like how we will adapt what, whatever we have and whatever was successful for us in the past for these new markets. For sure. Now, you brought up a point, too, similar to Mario, the question I asked him about Spain and Portugal is, well, Latin America. I think a lot of times people clump Latin America as one market. And you said you worked, for example, in Chile and Peru. And like from Chile is so different compared, especially like linguistically and the way the people are compared to Peru and other countries. There's so much diversity in these markets that it's in Brazil, for example. Sometimes people put Brazil with the Spanish speaking countries and it's just kind of a mess because it's really important, I think, to really focus on each market, which is kind of leading to my next question before we like deep dive into the topic i was just very curious to hear more about if you think that global marketing strategies um, are essential like why do you think they're essential to um when you're trying to connect with international audiences and if it is it always necessary to localize your campaigns for the different markets you work in so what about alan in your opinion in terms of you know why do you think these strategies are so important when you're trying to connect with the audience and kind of why do you, if you agree do you think and i think yeah, you yeah, do about localizing <laughs> each market and why why is that important yeah uh i definitely agree and again i just uh 
just repeating because I think that's really important. Um, you can have like the exact same product, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, everyone, like every single market will have a different way of buying that product. So your content, of course, needs, needs to reflect uh, whatever is the way that people make decisions in that specific market. Mm -hmm. So I think that's definitely important. And uh, it goes from, again, the content strategy from like your branding, for example, so, or your um, visual identity or even your, um, your tone of voice. So I remember when I was, uh, when we were producing content for Latin America countries, for example, uh, and we, back then we were a company like we were targeting millennials. And of mm -hmm. course we were trying to use like some slangs and trying to have more like an informal uh, communication. And, but the same slang used, let's say in Argentina is definitely different from one used in Chile or Peru. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, we needed people that would uh, know, like really get to know like those local slang so we could use in that in our communication on your content, for example. Mm -hmm. And you tap into like having local people working in the markets, like a community managers, or how do you get that insight when you're working in those markets? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were a startup, so, uh, we, we didn't have like that much budget to have, mm -hmm. uh, like a specific person in each of those markets. So what we tried to do was, uh, making like these, uh, double checks with, uh, local people, whether they were local travelers or local hosts, if what we were communicating back then would mm -hmm. make sense uh, to that specific market. So we were glad that our community were, was really engaged back then and they would help us, uh, making sure that whatever we are trying to say or push, right. uh, make sense. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people, and that's an important point you brought up is a lot of times I'll get, I'll hear like, oh, we don't have the budget to localize. So we'll just do it. So it's not necessarily a budget thing. Like you have found a way to do that with a, like a smaller budget because you're working in a, a startup company. It's, it's not impossible to do that. I think a lot of people will kind of brush it off and say, it's not as important. We'll just do it all the same, but you can find a way to make it work. And it's so important to really help grow your brand by having, you know, your brand speak to the people in the way they speak. So it's not just, you know, having this huge localization campaign and hiring all these people, you can still do it, but you have to be creative in that sense. Now, Mario, in your opinion, what do you think about global marketing strategies? Why are they so essential when connecting with international audiences? I mean, for, for me, I think it's essential, especially if you have a global brand, let's make the example, because the mm -hmm. brand and the, the values of the brands, they should be the same across all the markets, right? So mm -hmm. the perception you have about, we travel about many Intro, it's exactly the same anywhere in the in the market right it should be the same the values should be the same but then you need to have this kind of, of localization that's very important because markets are different people are different but um, but having a global strategy when you work in so many different markets it's it's key and uh, because then you lose the identity then you lose the the the, the experience then you, you lose the the sense of belonging to, to the brand that's even the people that work in the brand need to feel but also customers so it's very important to have a global strategy that, that it's uh, applicable across the markets then adapting to the, the different realities but for me it's it's key when you work in such a global brand yeah. sure now i guess this sounds i guess when we say it, it sounds really nice right that we're gonna you know do a global strategy and really maintain the brand and the voice and you know the same value that we're providing in every market across the board but What's the most challenging aspect when you're sitting down to implement a global content strategy and starting like you're beginning this whole you know brainstorming process and what you're going to do and how you implement it? What's the most challenging aspect, Mario, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I wanted to pick up on, on what Alan said because mm -hmm. uh, even if you if you are in a startup, of course you have different resources than work for for a big brand. But I remember that the, the most important challenge was when we were working with our agency, our marketing agency. They were coming up with a lot of creative ideas in English, in formal language or English slang as well and how do you then translate to 26 markets and this kind of this particularity is that the English language is a very easy language it's easy to create this kind of puns and this kind of of funny funny sentences but when you try to apply in Polish or in German or in Portuguese then it's quite challenging to, to say how can you transfer this funny idea into a, the same funny idea in, in the local market and so this was always very challenging without losing the idea of the campaign right because there was a reason why there was this kind of pun or this kind of funny aspect of the sentence in english was to be able to derive from the, for the markets because it was important for the campaign 
having this kind of uh, possibility to adapt to the local language was quite challenging. Uh, and then, of course, some campaigns don't work in those markets because those products doesn't exist. That habit is not, not like that. Talking about Valentine's, talking about Christmas, uh, talking about Easter. So there are a lot of uh, moments in the year that don't work necessarily across all the markets where the brand is, is there. So, but but the commercial meat is still there, right? So we need to find this kind of adjustment between between the markets. So it's important. It's it, but it's not easy, right? So that's yeah. that's the thing. And it needs, you need to you need to pay attention to to everybody. Yeah? Exactly. And that's like the most challenging part of any localization process. No, it's not only is it language, but it's also the holidays and kind of this like the market trend. What's going on? this like cultural expectation. And I think in my opinion, like my background is in, in translation and linguistics. And I started off as you know, translating content for different brands. And that was like always the most fascinating part. I think so many people just think it's, oh, it's the same language, you just translate it and it's fine. But no, it's like, you have to really look at the pragmatics of it and the semantics and kind of not only just and look at Portuguese from Portugal and then Brazil, it's totally different. And the way you address somebody and what, you know, third person versus second, you know, all these different things that come up. Um, in the same language or in the US versus the UK, it's still really, although we speak the same language and it's, we understand each other, the way you approach, um, you know, someone or in a, in a campaign, how you write to them and how you address them, it's going to be quite different. Um, and how about Alan, for you, like, what's something that you find most challenging? Is it this whole idea about like, you know, the language and kind of how you're going to, you know, create, keep your content the same, but different <laughs> across the different markets or what other aspects have you found challenging? Uh, yeah. So besides that, I would definitely say that distribution is a key mm -hmm. part. Uh, and of course, one of the most challenging parts when it comes to content strategy. So just to give an example, so right now at we travel, uh, when we were, uh, like working with different campaigns and content, uh, uh, for this for the US, uh, we were using LinkedIn, for example, to uh, promote a lot of those pieces. Uh, but then when we started working with the, uh, uh, some companies in Latin America, we realized that they were not using LinkedIn as much as other companies. And they were actually uh, engaging and, uh, uh, I don't know, like communicating with the, their peers using Facebook groups. Mm. So we started using LinkedIn because we thought that uh, even though we could like target them in LinkedIn with their uh, with LinkedIn tools and audience tools, we thought that would like work the same. But then we realized that those companies uh, were actually hanging out in Facebook groups, um, and then that's why we changed like we slightly changed the strategy so we could uh, produce content that would re would resonate with those groups. So just to yeah. give an example, so uh, the same with, I don't know, like with PR and if you are doing PR in different countries, mm -hmm. uh, the way you approach those uh, uh, those like media companies is different or journalists is different. So distribution is also something that you should consider uh, when uh, working with different markets for sure. And it, again, it's one of the most challenging parts because unless you know someone or unless you have experience with, with those different markets, it might be might take longer than you expect. Yeah. And that's such an important aspect that I think I forget about a lot. It's just like what channels to be putting your content on and which one's going to be more receptive. I just spoke to someone this week that was um, looking to branch off into the Nordics and they're saying how they found in their research, more people are engaged on YouTube than any other channel in those markets, which is interesting. I never really, you know, in my experience, I haven't had a lot of people ask for like YouTube community management it hasn't come up a lot as much, but in those markets, it's something that's really, I guess, success, like provides a lot of success, but also very um, in demand at the moment. So it's really interesting to hear about how like the channels too, where, where you're trying to engage with your audience is going to vary between the markets as well. Now, when you sit, when both of you sit down to start um, like, you know, implementing a campaign, kind of this brainstorming process or throughout the campaign itself, what are some best practices that you would recommend like um, to do, like things to keep in mind when you're doing the process, what tools to use, et cetera. So Alan, do you have any best practices that you could share with us? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so a couple of things, um, again, making sure that you have people in your team, mm -hmm. uh, whether they are, I don't know, contractors or freelancers or uh, employees that fully understand uh, the audience you are trying to, to target. Um, so it, it, can, it could even be like an agency uh, or something like that to help you out. Um, but if you are like a startup like me, just try to reach out to your own community and see uh, 
whatever information might help you. And also, uh, I would say be aware of the, the uh, like your budget might vary a lot depending on the marketing you're trying to reach. Mm-hmm. So, for example, in my case, uh, when we were when we try to do something like produce content in English, for example, it costs way more than producing content in I don't know uh, uh, Spanish or Portuguese. Mm-hmm. So. Just keep in mind that uh, depending on the market that you are uh, going to and the language and the type of content that you are uh, you want to to produce, uh, you might need to change your budget or you might not have the resources, especially again, especially if you are a startup. So you, you need to focus on something. Yeah, your budget is definitely going to change, especially if you're working, you know, in different countries that have different. I don't know, like the the salaries they make, for example. So you're trying to yeah, get yeah. someone in the Nordics, for example, they have higher salaries than in Southern Europe. So it's really yeah. things you get to keep in mind. Like, okay, well, if I'm going to try to go into this market, it's going to cost me more. And I think a lot of people forget that too when they're trying to plan ahead, for sure. Now, Mario, do you, have you encountered similar? Um, I don't know. Do you have any be- similar best practices in like, when we're comparing it to Alan, or do you find other things to be more? I totally, totally mm-hmm. agree with Alan. I, I think that connecting with with locals, being in your company and the, the local markets, or mm-hmm. being in your network, I think it's fundamental because you cannot understand the the realities of all the markets you want to play with. So mm-hmm. playing, so you need to really um, contact the, 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 your local colleagues, local networkers, local, mm-hmm. local people to make sure that the strategy you're you are creating applies to the reality. Otherwise, it's just well, what you're doing is not useful at all because it will not work, right? Mm-hmm. Also, channel-wise, as you said, uh, it, the habits of people in the North, in the South, in Asia, in Europe, is completely different. So you also need to pay attention to which channels are you going to use to, to talk to people. Mm-hmm. So for me, these two things about contacting local local people to really understand makes sense that if it works and then channel which channels to really use to reach out those customers or those people or those targets makes for me are two two essentials. So I fully agree with what Alan said. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so it's so important to do that. And also I think I just want to emphasize too, like it's just not about budget shouldn't be limiting because you can, you know, if you have a lot of money and a lot of budget, then you can hire, you know, community managers or you know, people that will be working for you, you know, every day in each market, giving you that information. But I've had clients too that didn't want to spend that much money, but they have, you know, they have a collaborator or somebody in each market that gives them a monthly report about what's going on in each market and kind of just, you can get insights in a very budget friendly way as well. It's not, I think a lot of times I find that people don't want to localize their content because it's more expensive, but there's ways around it. I think it's just about being flexible. And, sure. and, and in the end, and in the end, look, look, Kala, it's better to be a little bit unprofessional and talk to friends and mm-hmm. colleagues. You then you want to do that, mm-hmm. you just want to do things by the book, you launch a campaign and then yeah, it doesn't work because it doesn't work in that country, it doesn't work in that channel, it doesn't work with that yeah. language. So I think sometimes it's better to use your, your network of friends and colleagues. It's better than, than don't do nothing at all. <laughs> That's so true. It's like even a WhatsApp message and say, what do you think about this? Yeah, and exactly. if you, we all start somewhere, right? And I think we don't have to sh- always shoot for the stars to right. really kind of get the, the wheels spinning and that. Um, and I think the three of us, for example, we're very fortunate as inter- international people, but people who have lived in other countries and have you know these connections we do have those networks so i think a lot of times in the you know companies that we're working with we're going to have that because a lot of people are especially in europe moving around a lot more um so you're going to have those networks so definitely like you know dive into and tap into those networks and really get some insights from there you don't have to do this you know glamorous big campaign and invest all this money from the beginning you can start small and then see how the reaction is and then then invest the money later on depending on your success for sure. Now, another question that I receive all the time too is when we're gonna start a campaign, do I do everything in English and then I localize it or do I localize it from the beginning? So Mario, in your opinion, do you find more success when you start off with the mindset of, I'm gonna localize for every market, everything from the beginning, or I start with one idea, then later on I localize it? Well, um, from, from my experience, I think it works when you start with one idea and, mm-hmm. and, then, and then localize it because you need to have a base. You need to have a start a starting point. If you don't define that starting point and that base, you, you either you will lose yourself Either you're going in the wrong direction because uh, you need to you need to start from 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 a specific point. And then then you decide which road are you going to take because mm-hmm. the road depends on where the place you want to go. But you need to have one common starting point. Can mm-hmm. be language, uh, can be concepts, uh, can be visuals. I mean, it can be a lot of things. But you need to have one common starting point. And then of course localize is mandatory. But for me, it's important to have one one starting common starting point. Mm-hmm. 
And how about for you, Alan? What do you think? Uh, I totally agree with Mario. Just start with like one thing that makes sense to you, whether it's a language or a specific market. Um, and also just just adding to that, um, make sure that you like your internal communication is in place, especially if you're your leadership. Uh, I heard some cases of like of other companies that um, because you were work, I don't know, uh, like the marketing or content team were working with specific language, let's say like Spanish. Then the leadership would say, okay, so if we are uh, producing content, if our content strategy is contemplated like Spanish, so we, that means that we uh, we can impact and promote our content in all our in all, all Spanish speaking countries, and that's not true. So, I mean, it can be sometimes it depends on your product, your market, and everything, but uh, just make sure that uh, you you fully explain like what is your strategy and you have that written and it's aligned with your leadership. When I, I think it's, it's both very important points. And I think it's, I always tell people if they want my opinion on it, because I've had good situations come up where people will say, I want to do it this way and, and kind of, you know, stubborn about it. But I always say like, if you are working, so say for me, for example, and I'm going to start my brand, you know, and I'm going to do this and localize it for me, it's much more comfortable to do it in my native language and in the, in the language that I think of the company, because that way I maintain the ideas and the brand image and all. I, it's more important to like flesh that out first and then say, how do I transfer or translate or, you know, tr communicate these ideas in the different markets later on and kind of adapting it from there, in my opinion, I think that's always been like the more the most useful way of doing it because you you know what your ideas are and you feel it's, it's better to start off when you're comfortable talking about what you want to do and you you know your brand in a certain way that maybe you want to express it by convoluting it as i think mario was saying before like if you have too many things going on at once <clears throat> then you kind of lose touch you know with what what the real message is so it's kind of easier to start off small just like the budget thing we're talking about start out small and then kind of expand that way so i guess in terms of localizing it it's so much easier to do it that way because you're more comfortable with the idea and then you kind of expand it and separate it that way now i mentioned the pandemic twice or three times already in this conversation which i try not to do because i know it's something that we just are very much you know it pollutes everything from the news and everything we read social media it's kind of everywhere but it's also the reality we're living in and as marketers it's something that's really impacted um our work in the past couple of years because the way people have consumed content now it's very different i think than we're more i think i, I find that people are more attached to their phones and social media than ever before because we kind of a lot of us are you know either quarantining or spending time alone and i just it's just kind of mixed up the way we we view the world. So I wanted to know, in your opinion, in the past two years, have you seen a shift in the way that you, like when you're implementing a campaign, like have you changed the way you've done that according to like what's going on in the world and with the pandemic? Um, and have you seen a shift in how your target audiences or target audience consume, or markets consume your content? So Alan, what do you think about that? Uh, so yes, uh, as I worked in the travel industry, I was definitely affected. <laughs> <laughs> so we travel. So I mean, uh, when the uh, when it came, we, we our, our, like our revenue were not was not growing at all because people were not like traveling. So mm -hmm. what we did was kind of like using this opportunity to engage with our community, engage with our customers, make sure everything was right with them. Um, and then th that's when we decided to uh, start hosting these uh, monthly webinars or maybe bi-weekly webinars where we could we would invite one of those clients or any other industry expert uh, to provide information to the whole community and this kind of helped us make uh kind of gave us like another breath to keep going even though with everything that was happening and i can definitely say that this was one of the things that helped us uh, help the company uh men alive throughout the whole thing um right now i mean i think right now things are kind of changing because everybody were like doing something similar working with content especially with like online events or lives uh, webinars whatever so i feel that it's time for for us content marketers to reinvent ourselves because i i've heard from a lot of people at least in our industry that they are getting getting sick of like so many lives so many webinars so mm -hmm. what are the things that like that we can do now to uh uh to revamp like this whole thing you know like what else we can do and not yeah. and not just another live or another webinar so. right the online events can be tiring after a while too if we have so many zoom calls and all that um right. but also i think like a 
interesting in the travel industry as well during all of this is kind of this whole idea of you can't really do like we couldn't really implement this long-term campaigns anymore because i think with and a lot of people now i feel like are and these consumers in the travel industry are kind of curious about how can i travel it's kind of uh, with all these things changing and the restrictions and so i think like the content marketers in the travel industry now have a really unique perspective and unique platform uh, opportunity you know to connect but also to provide valuable information in terms of if you want to travel to this country you need x y and z which i think right i don't know if this has been in your case alan but like very complicated to keep up to date with all these changes that are going on and trying to provide consumers with like the right information i'm not sure if that's impacted your day-to-day -day as well yeah yeah i mean uh, especially for uh travel professionals uh like people working in travel companies or travel agencies uh i we really saw that they I mean, they were really focused on their travel businesses and sometimes they were really focused on making sure their travel experiences were like the best uh, they could have. But with the pandemic, we realized a lot of them were like shifting uh, their expertise or try to expand their expertise because they had, I don't know, to let people go in their companies. Uh, so they were lacking resources. So we, we saw this shift uh, when they were looking for us to try to learn about business management or uh, marketing or whatever resources they might need uh, in order to keep their business going. So, yeah. And then we, that's what we, I mean, we try to uh, offer as much as we can, not only sharing our uh, personal experience as a company, but also inviting others uh, to, to talk like uh, someone that is like, let's say someone that is really a marketing expert within the travel industry. So something really specific right. and that makes a lot of sense for us. Yeah, and so I think a lot of people have looked more at content as a source of information and of knowledge sharing now, especially as we're more in tune with content and uh, the content that we're consuming. Now, we just talked about travel and another big industry that got hit by the pandemic with fitness. And so, Mario, you work at Mans. So how is, I guess, your experience with the pandemic and kind of dealing with that sector? You also guys do yeah. like wines and stuff too, so it's like tourism related as well. No, so it kind of yeah. a lot of things got absolutely. impacted. Uh, absolutely, fitness and also also training uh, was uh -huh. very uh, very impacted in, in our company because of course gyms were closed, right? So mm -hmm. for for a long time, uh, and so then we we, we sense a, a, a shift on on the online training for for mm -hmm. example. So the online training it was something that was unthinkable two or three years ago nobody was doing online training at home while the personal trainer or the the gym were uh, uh, doing it live on right. streaming this was this was unthinkable so it was quite a change because nowadays we see a, a trend that a lot of people will like to continue to train at home mm -hmm. doing it the live session with the personal trainer or or, or, or with the with the gym or the trainer in the gym and, and transmitting it live streaming it live so this is a trend that of course we try to to respond and that's why we've created a lot of play, uh, platforms and content that can be used by the personal trainers and also by the gym owners to to, to transmit, to stream it to, to their customers um, at home. And we've, we've done this, uh, we've provided this kind of service, kind of platform, this kind of content to be able for gyms and trainers to keep, continue to work to, to, the, to their customers and trainees using this technology and this content so we did that also in, in our training side because we also do post graduations and, and and courses that we provide to our our customers so in, mm -hmm. in this case personal trainers and fitness professionals we also made a shift to to online uh, courses right so e-learning well so now of course as alan said we are trying to define which is the right strategy because as you mentioned people are tired a little bit of e-learning modules from a business perspective is, is it, it pays off because you have the product to do it you learn so from resource wise is is better but then you lose this kind of connection and this kind of, of things especially in fitness where you have a lot of practical uh, aspects of, of the training right so okay. We are in this moment of transition, but during pandemic, e-learning was, of course, uh, what helped us to continue to to, to thrive in, the, in this business. Yeah. And were people receptive to that? I feel like it could be like some people may be very motivated to work out and like do it at home online, but where some people maybe I don't know, I feel like it could switch, change the motivation of people in terms we of... Had, we had an increase. We had an increase. So we, we had wow. more students. You had more students participating in our e-learning sessions because it's then it's easier. You can be at home. And mm -hmm. during the pandemic, you also may work less uh, yeah. or even don't work at all. So you had time to develop yourself. That's true. So mm -hmm. we saw a growth in, in the number of students uh, joining our sessions. So yeah. uh, in the end, it was uh, it was quite interesting to also find this this aspect. Now we see 
the, 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 the trends a little bit changing again. So we need to now provide some kind of mixed uh, um, trainings, right? We have a e-learning session and never forget the practical session as well. So we're trying to find this balance right now. That's good. That's great. And I think a lot of people have focused on you know, mental and physical health during the past. We needed it. I think it was very important to keep those things in mind. Now, I wanted to know, I guess, during this past year and a half, like you guys mentioned just like some like, examples of webinars and online le like learning for fitness. But was there a specific like campaign that you launched in the past two years? And if not, it's OK. But um, that was successful and kind of why? What was something that was exciting that you both worked on in terms of a content marketing campaign in the past two years? How about Alan? What do you think? Uh, so we recently launched our We Travel Academy, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, like the whole idea of the academy came uh, came because of those webinars that I mentioned before. So uh, we realized that uh, people were engaging with those webinars, like asking a lot of questions and they wanted more. Um, and then that's why we came up with the academy idea. And it's basically where we gather like all content that we provide for our, uh, our audience or even for our, uh, our clients. And I, I would say that the most exciting part, at least the one that I, I feel more uh, passionate about is that we know that nowadays like the internet is super crowded with a lot of content, no matter if you are in a niche or not. Mm -hmm. And we really like the idea that like providing specific content to our industry. So, Let's say, for example, uh, if someone wants to learn about marketing, of course, you have like a lot of different places where you can go to, a lot of different blogs, web, uh, websites, resources. Mm -hmm. But what made us like uh, motivated about the idea is not was not just creating another like website or another blog with my content about marketing, but creating something that is specific to our uh, industry, to our audience, and to their challenge. So uh, how can you do digital marketing uh, if you are a travel agent, agency or if you are a tour operator? So that's uh, that's what we've been working on right now. Mm -hmm. And we are still trying to figure out like what's the uh, type of content that engages better with our audience, especially that nowadays, uh, especially because they are like usually small and medium business. So they mm -hmm. are <laughs> busy pretty much all the time. <laughs> so which formats of content we would resonate better with them? But uh, I'm glad to say that since we launched it, we, we've been seeing uh, uh, a lot of good feedback and uh, traffic is increasing, number of leads is increasing. So I think it's paying off now. That's awesome. And you're getting those results by providing a, a tool right, or a source of information that that's, like, adds value to the people, even if they're not going to maybe use your services, but still you're kind of providing this really good source of information and you know people are going to be more attracted to that. So it's great that you're seeing these like organic results as a result of, of this really cool academy initiative that you guys are working on. How about you, yeah. Mario, in the past two I mean, years? Anything similar or... Funny. It's funny because we did exactly the, the, the same, <laughs> not, not for the, the tourism area, but the, for the for the fitness. So we've, we've developed content that we we, we launched um, like every week or every month, depending also on the time we were living, based on four pillars like management, uh, business, people, and exercise. So based on these four main pillars, we were talking to, to fitness and club managers to provide them content, uh, how to apply a marketing strategy as a gym owner, how to motivate people to continue to train, how to combine uh, mental health with, with fitness. So all this kind of content we were also also providing during the last two years, and it was triggered by the pandemic, exactly. So it's something that we continue to do, we continue to provide and share with our fitness trainers and, and, and club managers, precisely because it's content that they, they felt the need to not only update their, themselves, sometimes even entertain themselves, occupy themselves, but even nowadays it still re requires useful views, so it's, um, yeah, we, we did exactly the same uh, like Alan did in the, the tourism area. So, yeah, I think the okay. pandemic has made us all just kind of shift inwards and be like, what can we provide to our audiences that would be helpful? I mean, this pandemic, I mean, this podcast came from the pandemic. So the one that we're on right now, so, you know, a lot of really cool, exciting, I think it's given us, although it was a challenge, it's given us an opportunity to kind of look inwards and be like, what can we share with the world um, through content um, that's going to be relevant and useful for people who are, you know, consuming more content than ever before, I think, online. So I also wanted to know, too, now in terms, we talked a lot about these 
I wouldn't say like soft skills, but kind of just more, you know, the ideas behind um, implementing a successful campaign. But I want to know a bit more about like what tools you use um, when implementing a campaign and like what are some must have tools or apps or things that you do in the process that are you, you use that really help you kind of structure a campaign and then implement it. So Mario, in your opinion, do you have any like must have tools or apps? I mean, it really depends on so on the, on the size of the company, the budget of the company, and right. the area where, where we are. I guess having some tool, you don't need to have a full implemented CRM system that is quite expensive. I mean, when you need to know to under, to have some sort of tool that may, may help you to create and manage this relationship with your customers, right? Mm -hmm. So which kind of content that they like, how, what's, the, what's the frequency of content that you would like to share with these uh, with these customers? So having this kind of methodology, not necessarily a tool, but at least a methodology, Methodology to be able to follow up uh, the conversation you're having with your customers via content sharing. So, for me, this is quite important to, to do so. Then, if you work with a with a global uh, brand campaign working so such different markets, I think it's important to have one tool where everybody, all the, the the colleagues in the markets, or the customers, or even that can can download this kind of content and then localize to it. It's like having your own. Uh, the database where, where, where your uh, colleagues or, or customers can even download. I'll give you an example. For example, we have we have um, a brand it's, which is Les Mills. It's an international brand yes. that, that we have the representation of it here in, in Portugal. And this brand provides also content for gyms, for example, to decorate uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the gym uh, with, the, with the, the classes that they provide, the programs that they have. So having this kind of tool to even to your customers, help them have the content to then apply to their own customers, to their end customers, is something yeah. that is very important to have this in place as well. So For sure. That's interesting too, like providing them with the tools in order to then spread your message. Yeah. It's kind of like having them as like a middleman in the in it Absolutely. is important. And Alan, in your opinion? Uh, just adding to what Mario said, uh, so if you're working specifically more with like content and content strategy, uh, the ones that I use the most are, of course, like Google Analytics, Google Search Console. And the good thing about those tools is that when they are free, of course, and uh, you can uh, use localization uh, features within them. So you can, uh, like, I don't know, uh, target whatever countries or whatever languages you, you are using in your campaigns. You can use those tools to, to make, like, get really specific data. Uh, Google Trends, the same uh, for SEO and content purpose. I use SEMrush a lot. Uh, they are paid too, but anyway, you can get like a free version with uh, limited resources, but it's still, you can get some uh, like things out of it. Uh, I also use Buzzsumo a lot. So to get uh, like training topics or uh, content ideas, especially related to like social sharing. So we get a lot of the ideas from there. And lately, uh, I've been using Spark Toto, uh, which is a good tool for, again, they are a paid tool, but you can use it for free uh, with some like li limited time or limited uh, amount of uh, queries that you can do there. But it's a good tool to, especially for working like me with uh, like a niche audience, to under better understand uh, like where is that audience uh, hanging out, like which channels or which are the trending topics within the audience, like hashtags they use or people they follow. So uh, it's a good tool for that. Yeah. No, I think two like big takeaways from the conversation today. Like one was kind of this whole idea of you really need to like curate, you know, depending on your, your audience, like what's going to be more, like not everything's going to work in every market or every campaign, but also a takeaway that I haven't, I didn't expect to have was this whole idea of budget shouldn't be an obstacle. I think what you're saying right now, Alan, like a lot of these tools are free or there's free versions of a paid version of a tool. So I think there's like no excuses, right? It's <laughs> really not, you know, launch a campaign to localize it, to do all these things that we've mentioned today. Um, money shouldn't be an issue. It's kind of more of being creative and looking for other ways of doing things for sure. Um, now we've come to the end of our interview um, or the chat. Now it's not really an interview anymore. It's, we're doing a round table conversation, which it's been a lot of fun. So thank you both for, for joining me today um, and kind of taking this risk with me as we start this new format of the podcast. But as we begin in the new year, and I think, you know, taking risk is something that we can add to our list of what we want to do in 2022. But what are some things that we should keep in mind when it comes to implementing these content strategies and especially these global content strategies um, in 2022? 
I don't know if you have any like piece of parting advice that you could give to our audience um, in terms of what sh- should we keep in mind as we start the new year? So Mario, in your opinion? I guess we need to be, be connected, be together again. That's, mm. that, that's the point. Uh, be together with your colleagues, be together with your friends, be together with your customers. So it's about connecting again to make sure that you follow up uh, the, the right strategy. So connect again. Now it's time to reconnect, I guess. Yeah, and making sure that our content reflects that and does that as well. Yeah, yeah. And maybe hopefully, you know, not just doing these webinars and things, maybe doing things in person or, you know, bringing that all back together through and using these marketing campaigns to help promote that, to promote this idea of unity, which I think we all really are looking for. <laughs> and I'm kind of just tired of being alone. <laughs> not alone, but you know what I mean? Kind of just, it's been a very isolating time um, for like, humanity i guess you could say um and alan how about you do you agree with that and if you have another idea yeah 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 sure definitely agree um and yeah just adding to 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 that um i would say that we again we kind of need to reinvent ourselves not only content marketers but like marketers in general and um just i mean stop blogging for like just the sake of like blogging or stop producing content just for the sake of producing content but i, I think companies uh definitely to invest more time in a long-term audience building and i think in the long term that's what will pay off uh, and again not just producing content for the sake of producing content right for sure i agree and i think you know and we're going to be able to do that and kind of making sure we're just putting more meaning behind the content that we do in the strategies and the campaigns that we implement this year i think um and that's kind of a goal that i had with with the podcast and i will do a shameless plug for people listening but like i really want to bring people together in a different way and i think you know we've i connected you two for example and now we've connected the three of us and i hope that if anyone that's listening that really feels like inclined they want to join the show like please reach out if you know someone that could fit a good profile to join us on the content mix and kind of have these conversations with us i'm more than willing so please reach out to us as well online um, you can reach out, out to us on social channels etc but i just think it's a really cool way i have found for me personally with the podcast it's been a really fantastic way to meet new people and connect with people without having that barrier but i do hope and we're hoping that this year will allow for us to have more in-person events because we also at the content mix we do in-person events networking events and stuff like that to provide you know build this community i'm hoping to do more of that in lisbon as well so we'll see what happens but i'm hoping that this year we can have a more human human connection i guess in terms of meeting people and and focusing on those relationships that we kind of had to put aside for so long so again as we come to the end of the conversation i just want to thank both alan and madu for joining me today and sharing really great insights from your own careers and your own perspectives um so thank you again for joining me um and i want to thank again the audience for listening in as you always do and as i always say for more perspectives on the content marketing industry in europe look out, definitely check out our website Vera content.com slash mix and keep tuning into the podcast for more exciting episodes with content experts and more roundtable conversations like this one. So we're looking forward to kicking off this year with more insights and more exciting perspectives. So thanks again. And I hope to see you guys in person soon in Lisbon, maybe, and then also to see you and um, the audience again in different episodes coming up. So thank you again for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Thank you. We'll talk soon. (laughs) Bye everyone. Thank you.